following is the recorded version of the presentation that was made by a great presenter during the Fall Idiot Quilter Retreat 2022. Um, some of you could not attend the retreat, but you did ask if I would record the presentations for viewing later, and here it is. So I hope you enjoy this. There are three different ones in this series, one by Adam from Adam Sews, one from Chris O'Neill from Sew the Distance, and one from Lynn Reinhardt of Cotton Art Studios. All three present presentations were excellent and very informative, so I hope you enjoy them. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'll introduce you. This is Chris O'Neill, everybody, and you probably have seen her YouTube channel. And if you haven't, you should check it out. You can see on the little board behind her, she's it's So The Distance is the name of the YouTube channel. And I have interviewed uh, Chris before uh, on my channel, so you may have seen that as well. And uh, Chris has a fascinating channel where she talks a lot about what we can learn from antique quilts. So I am assuming that that's what you're going to discuss with us today, Chris, am I right? I am. I'm going to talk about uh, collecting, caring for, uh, repurposing if we choose to do that, and just everything. It's just an overview of some antique quotes and vintage okay. quotes. Okay, that's great. And what we'll do is we'll save any questions that anybody has for after Chris's presentation. Um, and then you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask her whatever you like. And I'll also watch for any questions that may come up in the chat screen that I can uh, repeat at the end of uh, Chris's presentation as well. So Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself and you're on. <laughs> I'm on. Okay. Uh, so let me see if I can figure this out. Oh, by the way, I'm really relaxed. So if anybody has any questions, just interrupt me. I'm fine with that. That's not a problem at all. So I've never done this before. So if I screen share. Yeah. Okay. What do I want to do? I want to show my desktop, I think, right? So click on your desktop that's showing there. So there's a green box around it. Oh, oh. there we go. There we are. We got right, it. So if I go to my presentation and I think I can do full. Hit, hit your green button. Hit your the green green, green dot oh. at the top of the screen, like over to the left. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah. See the, the red, yellow and the green dot. Yeah. Hit the green dot. There we go. And there you oh, are. I'm way in the beginning. See, I was practicing because <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, great. So everybody can see the screen. Everybody can see me too, right? Yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, so my name is Chris O'Neill. My channel name and my business name is So The Distance, spelled S-E-W, The Distance. I have been doing YouTube for about two years. I left teaching at the end of uh, August, the end of the summer of 2020, and moved and had a whole life-changing thing. So I started a YouTube channel in September of 2020, just Everything was in chaos, so I figured why not, you know, put everything in my life in chaos too. And that's what I did. So I was a high school English teacher, and then I was an ESL teacher after that. And I do miss my kids, but I certainly don't miss teaching, especially in this climate right now. So uh, that's where I came from. I also started collecting quilts in my um, late 20s, early 30s, I just loved them. And I'll talk a little bit about how I got started and what inspired me from them. Uh, but it just, it just snowballed from there. And when I decided to create a channel, I looked to the thing that I knew and the thing that I was passionate about, and that was antique quilts. Now on my channel, I also have tutorials and I work with modern fabrics too. But one of the mainstays or consistent things that you'll always see are lessons from an old quilt where I review old quilts and I talk about as makers now what we can learn from makers from the past. So that's kind of my, I don't know, backbone of my channel. It's a lot of fun. I've reviewed 52 quilts in the past two years and I just keep collecting and collecting and collecting. I have about 86 antique and vintage quilts, which we'll talk about the difference uh, in my collection right now. And I just keep getting more and more and more. So <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do with all these quilts. I need to start selling them or something, uh, but they are um, all so dear to me and it's hard to even part with one. So 
We good? Any questions so far? No? Okay. All right. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm 50. So if you do the math, it's been about, I've been collecting for about 20 years or so. All right, here we go. I think I can do this, right? Well, why won't it let just, me? Just swipe your, your mouse. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, so smart. Okay, so what's the difference between vintage and antique? And antique? And we, we throw these words around a lot with antique fabrics or vintage fabrics. And vintage is 40 plus years old, so I am considered vintage. So anything before 82 would be considered vintage. And antique is anything 100 years old or older. And I'm going to probably use them interchangeably, so forgive me, but that's really the way you're supposed to refer to things like this. And I'll do my best to do that as I'm talking about some of the quotes I'm going to show you. So, oh, so first of all, so I put a lot of quotes on the screen. This was one that I uh, reviewed recently. Uh, this is the Lone Star Quill or Star of Bethlehem. There's a few different names for it. And this was something I got at an auction. And you can see the coloration differences with the, hopefully you can see that, the coloration differences with the um, star points. And we're not quite sure what caused that. And a lot of speculation goes into reviewing these old quilts, but you can also see there are some odd things happening here. The placement of the pieces weren't exactly right. It's still an incredible quilt. And I think that's something as makers, something we can learn from this quote is that sometimes you do make those mistakes and sometimes they're happy accidents because they add interest to some of the quotes too. All right. Okay, so where to start? I think I can move that. Okay, here we go. All right, so the way I started was collecting and I started with some family quilts, which I'll show you in a moment. But if you're interested in starting, you can look at some recent reference books. These are three of my favorites. Anything by Barbara Brackman, it, she's definitely the pioneer in this field, is incredible. And uh, I actually just got another book too by her. So I'm not sure exactly where it's at, but anything by her is fantastic. These dating fabrics books are awesome. Let me show you. I have one. And you can see that it actually has pictures of fabrics. Now, of course, every fabric ever made is not in here, but you can kind of get an idea of the fabrics from these references. So you can see if you have something like it. And then also at the beginning of each chapter, it tells you what is going on in history and how that influenced the quilts. So these books are awesome if you're interested in antique fabrics or antique quilts. Just to uh, let you I, know, Christy, uh, Chris, just sorry to interrupt you. When you showed that book, we can't see it because the screen share just shows your slides. Oh, so, it doesn't show me too. Oh, okay. All right. No too. problem. I'm sorry. So, I'll show it at the end. Yeah, that'll be great. Awesome. Okay. So uh, there's also um, the internet, of course. There's, you know, you, there's Facebook pages. There's tons of stuff out there but Barbara Brackman would be somebody I would definitely look into if you're interested that's a great starting point and then quilt lectures at quilt shows a lot of times there'll be antique um, and vintage quilt dealers or appraisers that can give you a lot of information and then historical societies is one of those places where we don't always think about but a lot of times they have a nice collection too in your hometown of quilts from that area and there's just so much information that you can find now it's important to know, I'm just a hobbyist. I don't have a degree in textiles. I don't, um, I'm not a quilt appraiser. I'm none of that. I just love looking at old quilts and learning about them. Okay. So the things that you wanna consider if you're interested in dating the quilts and figuring out, okay, what year is this? Is the fabric, the batting, the finishing and the style. So with the fabric, again, there's, Different time periods influence different times in fabric, different dyeing techniques, over dyes, printing presses, all that went into the um, influence of these quilts. So it's something you can learn a lot about that and then you can date your fabrics. But there's so many also reproduction fabrics. So it's tricky because you get into this situation where you're like, is this a reproduction, a really good reproduction? or is this authentically old? And, you know, I wish I could tell you I'm great at that. I'm not, <laughs> I struggle with that too. But the batting is a really wonderful clue because polyester batting started to show up in our quilts around 1950. So if you have a cotton or wool 
or even a flannel sheet or anything like that, you see any of that, usually it's an older quilt, not always, but usually it is until very recently. And I say within like the last 20 years where cotton came back, um, you're seeing a lot more of the natural fibers in our quilts now. So that's always a good indication. And if you're not sure, and if there's a, maybe a tiny hole and you can pull a little tiny piece of that batting, if you melt it or try to melt it, if it smolters, it's, it's a cotton. And if it melts, it's a polyester. So that gives you a breaking point on your dates. Finishing also has a huge influence because, you know, we just like now we go through trends where tying was very popular or quilting or how many quilts per inch were popular. All of that, all these trends have, have followed quilting from probably the beginning, but, you know, definitely within the past 100, 150 years, you can see those trends. And style is another one. Uh, you know, think of crazy quilts, how popular they were in the early 1900s. And it was all about showing off how much you could do, how much embroidery you could do. Or I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember stack and whack, you know, uh, there's always trends going on with quilting and there always has been. And this quilt that I'm showing right here is a drunkard's path. It's a two colored quilt. And I'm dating this around 1910 or so. It has a cotton wool blend batting. It's like cotton and, and wool were put on top of each other. It's a very bulky quilt, uh, but the fabrics are definitely, the dye isn't super stable. You can see that there's some fading and some bleeding on it, um, but that's where I'm dating it. And again, I, I'm not an appraiser. I'm not positive, but I try to think of the best of my knowledge with these quilts. Are we good? Any questions so far? I feel like I'm going very fast. <laughs> we good? Christine, when you're when you're done, um, yeah. I have something to show you in the whole subject of this. So when oh, you're done. Fantastic. I would love to see right. it. Thank you. Okay, so I thought we'd play a little game on guessing the year. Uh, of these, uh, although I know you can't see me here. Uh, so if you can take a guess at these three, and I'm going to give you a little bit of information. This one's all polyester, the front, the middle, the back. It's like that um, polyester fabric that you had, like, I don't know, my grandmother always wore them, the real stretchy, itchy polyester, like double knit polyester pants. That's what this is all made of, if you can imagine working with that. So that's the clue I'm going to give you. Anybody have any guesses with age? 1970s. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. This is like 1970s, mid 1970s. I'm even thinking with the bright colors because there's also some uh, plaids and stuff like that in here. 1967. 1967 for this one, you think a little older? Okay, it could be. I agree, I agree that it's a little bit closer to the late 60s. Um, and uh, the, the, the name of the fabric is called crimpoline. Yes. And <clears throat> I have reason to be quite sure, since I'm older than you, dear. <laughs> so I, 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 I would say that uh, that's late 60s is, okay. is quite possible. Okay, cool. And what's the name of the fabric, did you say? Crimpoline. Crimp crimpoline. crimpoline. I've heard of that one. Yep. Crimpoline. Crimpoline. I'm going to write that down because see, I'm always learning here. C-R-I-M-P-L-E-N-E, -E, I believe. Okay. I wrote it down. I'm going to look into it because I'm, I'm always learning when I'm going through. No problem. This. Could it so, be also, sorry to interrupt, could it also okay. be Fortrell? What's it called? Fortrell. Fortrell. That was, um, uh, back in the late seventies. Okay, poor trial. I will look into both of those too. It's definitely a very scratchy quote. I can't imagine cuddling up with this thing. So, but I, it's, I'm I, sure warm. How about? I would think it would probably like. Is it all made um, of polyester? It's 100% polyester, right down to the binding. Okay, I would pro um, the fabric might be from that year, but I would say it's uh, was made earlier or, or later. You think so? Yeah, it could be made later. 80s. 
90s. You think yeah. so? It could be. I got this at a yard sale. Yeah, um, even today, people are, my um, my aunt makes quilts out of four trowel. Oh, it's okay. What I was called, and they're made today, if you can find any old clothing or anything like that. And it's 100% so, made out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And now this was also, I forgot to mention, this was completely hand pieced too. Oh, okay. Hand pieced and hand quilted through that. Late oh, okay. 60s. Late then, 60s. Yep. Yeah, late 60s. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I had a little uh, newer, but I guess, you know, I, I go with you guys. I, you probably know a little bit more about that than I do as far. It was the first time I'd ever seen a full 100% polyester quilt. And I paid $7 at a yard sale for it. Wow. Um, and it's a huge quilt. Um, and it's, it's, it's really neat. It's just, uh, and this is one of them that I've, I've reviewed on my channel too. So how about the um, log cabin here? Hmm. Is. That's an 1800s quilt. Yes. Yep. This is definitely 1800s. Really? Yep. Wow, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So. 1880. Sorry? I'll guess 1880. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, 1880. Well, yeah, I, I, that's where I'm dating this one, and I'm I'm fairly certain with this one. This one I've had a friend of mine who does appraise quilts. She looked at it. She didn't do a full appraisal on it, but it is, yeah, 18. She said around 1880, 1890. Uh, the middles, which are pink now, have faded from a purple, uh, we think, and there has been some fading with it. But you can see, for the most part, they faded evenly. So that's always a really good clue. Uh, can you see my cursor? You can see my cursor, right? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay, as I pointed, but you can see here where it was folded and light got to it, and we think it was folded like this because there are you can't see it on on this picture, but there are some crease lines here, and uh, it is totally bleeded out or totally faded out. Um, but it's a really beautiful quilt, and uh, this one I got at Brimfield in Massachusetts at the big flea market. And I bought this one for my father because he is a Civil War history buff, and I knew he would absolutely love this quilt. And this is part of his collection. And I probably got this 30 years ago. So it's a really interesting quilt. Um, and I can't remember what I paid for it. It probably was closer to 100 at the time. And we go through with, and I'll talk a little bit about what to pay for quilts because it definitely goes through trends where everybody's collecting, like right now, everybody's collecting antique quilts and then it fades out of popularity and it comes back in. So it really just depends. Uh, and then I have this one over here. Can you guys guess that one? That one had a date on it and I got that at a yard sale too. Anybody? 1980s? 80s? Yep, so 86, this was made. And uh, just a note, when I go to these yard sales and I find quilts, I try my best to talk people into keeping them, okay? <laughs> I'm the worst at that because I feel like they're family heirlooms, you know, keep these quilts. But most of the time, people have no interest in keeping them. I think once I can convince somebody to keep it, but I don't know if she was just humor, humoring me or not. <laughs> uh, yeah, is that so this yellow is... poplin or polished cotton? Uh, no, you know, no. It, well, it, it, I thought it was the chintz. So is that that? Yeah. So the polished cotton. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely got that. Um, I don't know. Waverly. Wave. Yes. Yes. So there's definitely what I think are Waverly fabrics. There's some calicos in here too. Uh, but when you're dating quilts or looking at how old they are, you know, you're always looking at the, the newest fabric in it because I know I have probably on my shelf fabrics from uh, well, I know I have your 2000 fabrics that have 2000 written right on them. So, you know, those are 22 years old. And if I put them in a quilt, that wouldn't be the newest fabric necessarily going into it. So it can be tricky. But yes, yeah, so there's some calicos and all kinds of wonderful stuff in this. And I think I paid $2 for this quilted yard. So you can find them at yard sales. It's crazy. All right. Okay, so if you're starting a collection or expanding a collection, the first place is to look at family. This particular quote here was on my bed growing up. My great grandmother made it. It is all done by hand and it has trapunto. You can see it sort of here. 
Uh, everything is hand quilted, hand appliqued. And you can also see some stains. I didn't take real good care of this quilt. I ate on it. I think this was chocolate or something like that. And I didn't, of course, as a young kid, didn't understand quilts. This wasn't something that was treasured necessarily in my house either. Not that my mother you know, hated quilts, but it wasn't a thing, you know, so it was just a, something that we had that we used. And we had a lot of my grandmother's great grandmother's quilts in the house. This was one of them. So I have this one today. It, I treasure it. It's just a wonderful, cozy, snuggly quilt. And it has some damage and I have since repaired it. And I just want, you know, I, I, I really treasure this one because in a way, even though I didn't know it as a kid, this is one of my introductions to quilts and it's fantastic. Uh, yard sales. I go to a lot of yard sales, especially in the summer, and um, I can find quilts. Usually, usually I find at least one when I go out on a Friday or Saturday here in Pennsylvania. We have um, yard sales on Fridays, sometimes even Thursdays, so I try to get there early. Uh, thrift shops. I am a huge thrifter. I go, I get all kinds of vintage things at thrift shops, and quilts are one of them. Uh, if you are looking to start a collection, become very friendly with your thrift shop owners or for the, the managers of the thrift shops. A lot of times uh, people will call me and tell me that they got quilts in. Uh, but something to remember, which really upsets me, is that it, at least here in Pennsylvania, if there's even the smallest hole or damage on a quilt, they have to discard it. So it goes in the trash. And I've tried to tell people, you know, please just call me. I'll trash dive. I'll, I'll go into the dumpster to get these quilts out to save them. But a lot of times that's what happens. And then my all-time favorite thing to do is auctions. And I, I could go to an auction every day if I wanted to <laughs> here in Pennsylvania. They seem to be all over the place. And I do uh, scan um, the auctions daily. Usually I, in, if you're interested in this, you know, go to auctionzip.com put in your area and then I put in a keyword for quotes. So I get notified when quotes are coming up at auctions. They're my favorite. You spend the more, more money at them, but you can preview, you can look at them, you can touch them. It's a little, and you know, they're there, you know, when you're getting ready to go looking for them. So let's talk about that. So there's another one from my family. This was also made by my great grandmother. This is a crazy quilt. Uh, this is dated, we think, just from talking to family members in history, um, the 1940s, 1950s. My mother remembers uh, her grandmother sitting and, and making this. So it's very special. The back is 100% um, wool and there's no batting in this. So it's another one that I just love. And if you're sick, you know, like with the flu or whatever, Curling up with this, you're going to stay warm. And then this one I got at a yard sale. This is a firecracker quilt. Uh, a lot of times this was used as signature blocks. And this is another one in my collection. And this one I, I think is around the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s. There's some 30s prints in here, but they're definitely, we see some newer prints like down in here and here too. Thrift shops. So this is my bet, probably my best find. This is a postage stamp quilt. This uh, we believe is is from the 1930s, and um, it's a lot of ties in that, isn't it? <laughs> if you turn it over, the the back is uh, navy blue, and those are variegated yarn ties. So the variegation, it looks like a starry, starry night. And I have I have a video on all of these quilts that I'm presenting today, so you can see each one of them up close and personal in some of my videos. And uh, this one was uh, $30 at a thrift shop. And this was one where somebody called me and said, hey, I, I just got this in and I'm going to put it aside for you. Uh, I love it. Those little squares are all one inch finished. So you can just imagine the work. It was all hand pieced. And then, of course, hand tied. Any questions? Are we doing OK? Looks like we are. OK. All right, auctions. This is my favorite. Uh, you can see here, this was an auction that I went to. It was a charity auction for, um, we have what's called Rescue Workers, which is uh, thrift shops around here. And they do a lot of wonderful things for homeless uh, community and also just people down on their luck. They always, every year in April, have an auction with uh, some of the best things that have been donated. And um, 
these are the quilts that were at this auction that I was at. Uh, I actually purchased this one and this one, and then this was the, the Lone Star one that you saw. And then the other ones I didn't. And I'm to a point uh, in my collection that if I already have a quilt like it, I'm not going to purchase it, you know, uh, unless it goes for a really good price. But, you know, you do pay more at auctions. And actually, this one is behind me. So when I'm back on camera, you can see it hanging behind me. Um, so I'm looking for different things. And I think I paid, I want to say, I think this one has a little bit of damage. And I think this one was like 60 and I paid maybe a hundred for this one. So I am getting up into the prices. This picture shows a recent auction I went to about four weeks ago. Best auction for quilts that I've ever been to. They had, uh, I think they had ended up with like 36 quilts and I walked away with eight of them. They went high uh, for the eight quilts that I bought. I think I paid a total of $500 for all eight. Uh, some were in better shape than others. My problem is I see a quilt I want and I get into that zone with auctions that it's like, I'm going to own this and I'm going to save it. So I tend to bid a little bit more than I should necessarily. But some of these quilts, oh my goodness, they were incredible. I could have taken them all home. Uh, and I, I really, I, I only did eight. So I think I'm doing pretty good. Okay. You always look out for this one. This is my competition at this woman goes to all the competition, all the auctions I seem to go to. And it's always a good clue because she's got this on. <laughs> okay. So I always try to, if you're going to auctions, just a tip, I try to stay, sit very far from her or some of the other collectors because I also have a big heart. And then I always, I lose them because I'm like, oh, I don't want to drive up the price. And so if you're like that and you're like me, I kind of try to sit far away from these people so I don't see their faces as I'm trying to outbid them, but it's all in good fun. And um, I've never talked to her, but I do see her a lot. I'm sure when she sees me, she's like, oh boy, here we go. She's going to bid me up. Okay. All right. Any questions before I get into the care of quilts? There is one quest. Oh, we are going to talk about the care of quilts. So I'll save this question that somebody wanted to know exactly that. So, okay. Oh, great. Okay. So we're going to talk about um, caring for quilts, cleaning, storing, repairing, repurposing, and using. And I'm going to go through each of these points with you. Uh, so this particular quilt I got at a yard sale too. I can't remember how much I paid for it. It is um, a brick quilt, which I love. And this, I believe, is like 1970s uh, for this one because of some of the fabrics. There's also some old sheets cut up and put into this too. And the backing is a sheet as well. It's also tied. All right, so cleaning. All right, so I came home from that auction. These are all the quilts I got at that auction, by the way, or some of them, I should say. And um, while I was at the auction, my mom and dad were with me and it was a freezing cold day. We were sitting outside, it was rainy. And as they're, I'm winning the quilts, I'm piling them on my mom because she is really cold, okay? And at one point I put this red, red and white and blue quilt on her and she says, I, this smells so bad, I can't stand it. And we couldn't figure out why because it, it didn't smell old, it smelled, it actually smelled like BO, it was gross. And I pulled it off of her and I said, well, this will be the first one we take care of and wash. And you can see how filthy this water is. That was the fifth washing with this quilt. Uh, and I was just hand washing and hand washing and hand washing. So the way I wash my quilts, if there are no holes, so if we go back to this one, this one was newer, there were no holes, there was no anything that would concern me. I put this in the washing machine, regular detergent, you know, and then I air dried it. So that's how I would get this queen clean. But with these older quilts and um, some of them were very, um, there were holes and some issues, uh, I decided to hand wash them. Now, you know, I'd love to say this is my formula for hand washing quilts and, you know, say this is what I use. There is a few products on the market. There's retro clean. There's a few other ones. But a long time ago, when I started collecting, somebody had said, a friend of mine from my quilt guild, who, you know, she was, well, she passed away a few years after that. She was in her 80s, late 80s, I think. And um, she told me Biz from Walmart. Do you guys have Walmart in Canada? Yes, yeah. we do. You do. Okay. All right. Walmart Biz is the name of the detergent and um, mixed with white vinegar and baking soda. Okay. Now, percentage wise, it depends on how dirty they are. 
And I wish I could say, this is what I do every time. Um, I eyeball it on how dirty they are. I start slow and then I add to it as I'm cleaning them. So I try to start with just cold water and then move up from there. Um, this one took a lot of work. Uh, and I use a big tub usually in my backyard to do this, uh, or I use the home tub and, and wash and soak them. I do soak them for about 15, 20 minutes. Again, it depends on the soil level. And then I hang them to dry. Now, notice hanging these to dry, I don't just hang them up. I make sure they're supported uh, and I won't leave them hang. Depending, well, depending on the quilt, I wouldn't leave it hang a terribly long time. It's just basically to get it from being super, super wet to damp and then lay them on a bed on, you can put some sheets or some towels around it too, to dry them. And they, it just, it works wonders and they smell so wonderful and crisp afterward. So that's what I use. Use caution with that. You know, I, it, I'm okay risking my own quilts. I get nervous telling other people what solutions and stuff to put on their quilts. You know, you can always test it. It, you know, it, it really is what works for me. But again, if I lose a quilt to it, I'm not, it's my quilt. Okay. So I, I get nervous telling people what to use, uh, to start slow, use cold water quilts. Any type of fabric is that it's most vulnerable when it's wet. So keep that in mind. You don't want to like for this quilt, it was my husband and I lifting it out and just squishing out the water, not wringing it um, as we did it, making sure it's super supported because it could rip too as you're pulling out a wet, heavy quilt. So be cautious about that. But they look so pretty on the line, don't they? <laughs> oh, so, okay. So here's another cautionary tale. I got this at a yard sale. It's called the tatter quilt. I have a video on this one too. And, um, and I don't want to keep like sounding like I'm advertising, but I do, if you guys are interested in a particular quote, you can go see more information about it. Uh, this one was folded up. I spotted it. I went over, I'm like, how much? She said, $10. Didn't even open up, took it home. And when I did open it up, I saw how destroyed it is. I still have this, of course, in my collection. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I could repair it. It has a lot of damage though. Uh, so I may repurpose this one. Um, I should have opened it up. I probably still would have bought it though, but I probably should have opened it up. But this is a prime example of somebody putting this through the machine. At least I think so. Uh, the washing machine uh, where there were holes or weakened um, seams. And interestingly enough, it's the fabric breaks that breaks down, not the threads usually. Uh, so when people talk about using old thread, I don't, I'm thinking it's the old fabric that breaks down because this some of these threads are 100 years old and they're still holding up. So if you find some old threads, maybe they aren't as bad as you think. You can always tug on them to see uh, if they break, but um, I'm always amazed by that. It's the fabrics, not the threads that break down. So, okay. And then uh, this particular quote is another example. I actually just did the video on this last week. Uh, this one is a really great example of a quote. I got this on eBay a few years ago, and um, it is an excellent, excellent condition. And I did put this one through the washing machine. So you can see the difference you know, it just really depends on the quilt. All right. Okay, so let's talk about, any questions? Anything? No? Okay. All right, let's talk about storing quilts. So I um, probably have, uh, well, I have four of these ladders. You'll see one behind me. I have them all over my house because I have so many quilts. And I do decorate them. I try to pull out um, fall quilts and put, you know, rotate them. Uh, I also layer them on my spare bedroom bed. So this is probably six or seven quilts deep and that keeps them nice and flat away from the sunlight. And then I have a few that I have in a basket too. And then I have some on shelves. I have them all over my house. I have some of my parents that they have on display. Uh, so the big thing I always look for is to making sure that I'm, I'm refolding them. So those creases don't uh, become permanent in the quilts and that I'm uh, keeping them out of direct sunlight so there's no fading. So, and then I just, I rotate them probably every month or two, um, especially for the seasons as well. Um, so let's talk about repairing old quilts. Um, some things to consider, you know, are the age of the quilt, the amount of damage and can it be repaired? So this was my garbage can quilt. 
which I'll show you afterward. I did repair it. Uh, and I did pull this out of a garbage can at an estate sale that somebody didn't want anything to do with it. And I took it, it was in rough shape. Um, and I debated on repairing it. So you can see some of the damage. It was also filthy. The inside was a um, old blanket, which was popular at the time. Uh, and one of the issues, the reasons why this particular quilt from the 70s, 60s, 70s, I believe, uh, was falling apart was because there weren't enough ties. So it was a tied quilt and it created a strain on these fabrics. And we see how like around the ties, the fabric just pulled away. Uh, like I said, it was also filthy um, and really stained and everything. So I ended up restoring it. Um, and I have that quilt here that you can see. Uh, and I just took it apart and remade it. Here's another one that I have in my collection now. And this quilt was used in a garage. It has a ton of um, like oil stains and you can see a dog chewed it up here at this corner or some sort of animal down here too. It was folded up. I think it was a dog bed. This batting was so clumped up. You can see it over here. It was just, it was a wool batting and it had just pulled together. It was also quilted with embroidery floss or a heavy, um, waxed type of thread. So it was just in really rough shape. I took this apart because it was in such rough shape and I knew I wouldn't use it. And I, um, I have the top here, which I can show you, although it's across the room, I'll have to get up and get it. Uh, but I do have the top. I am going to wash it and try to requilt this one because it's a beauty. It really is. And it deserves to be saved. <laughs> Oh, this one. Oh boy. This one's the one that has given me the most trouble. So this one I call the wonky quilt. It's just a quilt top. It is all done. The person who made it uh, machine stitched it. So it's a machine pieced. Everything's on the bias and the maker, I don't believe really understood how to work with the bias because it is so wonky and so puckered that I have no idea what to do with it. I would love to finish this. It's beautiful, but the puckers in it, we're not talking about something I can ease in. We're talking bubbles of puckers in this. Uh, and I have it here. Um, every now and then I pull it out and start to deconstruct it. But every time I get so frustrated, so it is hanging on a ladder. It looks beautiful. I would love, love to restore this one, but I, I get so frustrated. I'm not sure what to do with this one. It's a beautiful quilt though, but everything, everything's on a bias. You can see kind of the puckering up here and it's severe. It's not like minor because minor I could ease in, but hmm. all right. And then let's talk about repurpose, re repurposing. And I touched on this uh, quilt, old quilt um, coat. So this is a hot topic. What do you think? Should you be able to make quilts, coats out of quilts? Anybody have an opinion? I say yes. Any, yeah. Because if they're going to end up in landfill or they're going to end up uh, just as a dog's bed or something like that, and they have all this work in them and the whole bit, but they're maybe beyond really repairing them as a quilt, I'd say, sure, if you can get uh, more life out of it as a, another object, go for it. Right, yeah, that's, that's how I feel too, but I know there's a lot of people that don't. Although I have to say, when I'm looking at my old quilts and thinking about sawing them, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want them to be cut up, uh, but I need to let go of that. But personally, I feel like even as a maker, if my quilt's still out there 50, 60, 100 years from now and somebody's treasuring it, I'd rather not see it in a, in a closet. I'd rather see it be mm. repurposed and used for whatever. So um, I'm on that too. And there are so many quilts out there, you guys. There, I mean, we saw that with the one um, auction that I went to. There are just so many quilts. And today, took, uh, today we were looking at some gorgeous uh, handmade bags. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you can get good spots on a quilt, you could make uh, a beautiful bag uh, to carry. Absolutely. I'm going to show you what I did with an old quilt too here in a minute. Uh, so yeah, you can, I mean, especially if it's beyond repair or, you know, or not, I mean, I, it's not, it's, I would rather see them be used and if they're going to be used great. And, you know, that's, it's up to the, to the person who owns it. It's their quilt. Not, not every quilt has historical value. 
absolutely right. Exactly. And I think we get into a situation where we think that, you know, and sometimes it's just, it would make a beautiful bag or table runner or what coat or whatever it is you want to make out of it. (laughs) That's how I feel, but I respect anybody who has thinks differently. You know, I can see both sides of it. I know it's a hot topic right now. I'm, I made a, a quilt jacket for my middle daughter who graduated in uh, from high school in the 80s. And now my granddaughter is wearing that quilt jacket. And I bought the quilt. It was in horrible shape at Canton, Texas at the they call it first Monday and I feel like I saved that quilt because it had holes in it and all kinds of things but it's pretty neat to see my granddaughter wearing something my daughter had I love that yeah because everything old is new again right the trend of that's another thing that I think is um important to note is this whole idea of quilt coats is not new you know it was trendy before it'll be trendy again and um yeah so but, you know, if you do go to auctions and you don't want people to know you're a quilt collector, you might want to avoid this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyone else have any opinions or should I move on? We're good. Okay. All right. So I had an old quilt. Actually, I think it's on the next slide. This one. This was my grandmother's quilt. She made it for me. Uh, it's all hand pieced. It was tied with this red uh, yarn. And this is my dad's mom who made this when I was, I, I, I don't know, I was probably a teenager when it was made. It's made from all old clothing. At the time, I didn't collect quilts. At the time, I really didn't care. And when I moved, got married and moved to Massachusetts, I, um, I had it in a tote. It was then put into the garage and then some critters moved into it. Fast forward to moving to my next house where now I am a quilter. I unearthed this thing and am devastated that um, I let this happen because I didn't treasure this quilt and that's all on me. So what I did with this and um, because it was gross, I mean, it was, I I tried cleaning it. I tried washing it, all of it. Uh, So I decided that all these parts that aren't, you know, gross (laughs) with all the gross stuff that's going on here. I think I have the back here too. Yeah, you can see the back too. The back wasn't near as bad as the front. But let's see if I can go back. Can I? What's going on? Nope. There we go. So what I did was um, I made Christmas stockings for my mom and dad last year out of that quilt. And uh, I took the pieces and just took a stocking pattern and made these. And then I put a label inside explaining it. Even the hangers are Uh, parts of the quilt and then just recently I my cousin we share the same grandmother my grandmother has since passed away Uh, she's having her first baby and I took the middles these middles are from that quilt and I made her a baby quilt and then these cornerstones are also salvaged from that quilt so I tried to save as much as I could from this quilt I also made a pin cushion and a few other things Uh, and you know I feel like I honored my grandmother in that way even though I didn't honor her when I was uh, storing this quilt, obviously, which breaks my heart. Uh, luckily, I do have a couple other ones that she made me, but, oh, you know, mistakes. Okay. And then using your quilts, this is my dog, Daisy. Uh, and she's sweet. She, I do use my quilts, uh, a lot of them, most of them. Um, I think they're meant to be used. That's my opinion. Uh, you know, I care for them, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, take them out. Well, I don't take them out into the garage or anything like that, have oil spill all over them, but they're out. And if they're, you know, if they're on a show, people are, are welcome to grab them and use them. Uh, and I think that's important. Now I do have one caveat with that. So this was one of my first antique quilts that I purchased. And um, for years, like 15 years, I used it as a tree skirt. And you can see that here. And here it is opened up. And when I started researching antique quilts and started get really getting into this, I started looking at this quilt thinking, wow, this is, this is old. And um, this is the oldest in my collection, um, come to find out. And I had used it for years as a tree skirt. And this one is pre-Civil War. It is amazing. This one has been appraised. It is 
it's amazing. It has a lot of holes and a lot of damage, but it's really old. This one I'm not using anymore as a tree skirt, even though it looks really pretty. And maybe I should, but I just can't bring myself to even have this one out uh, where any of the elements or anything can happen to it because it is that old. Okay, thank you. That's my um, presentation. I'm going to get out of this one. Um, stop share. Okay. All and right. There are a uh, couple of uh, questions that sure. uh, came up in the chat. Um, first of all, uh, Rebecca says, did you find any quilt labels on the quilts? And I'm sure many people forget to label, myself included. Not usually. The newer ones I do, not the older ones. I did buy at that auction. One of them had embroidered the year. It was 1953, uh, was embroidered in the corner, but there was no other information. So usually there aren't any labels and um, it's unfortunate. And Laura would like to know again, where, where are you located? Oh, okay. So I live now in Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania. Uh, and, uh, but I was in Massachusetts for 27 years prior to moving back a few years ago. Okay. I grew so, up here though. I grew up here in Pennsylvania. So my question is, how did you get into doing this? What, you know, like, I, I think you did touch upon this, but I just want to hear it again. What gravitated or drew, drew you to going off and investing all this money and all this time in old quilts. I I just love them. You know, uh, I I love I love looking at them and I love studying them and seeing what I can learn as a modern quilter now from people who didn't have rotary cutters and didn't have all the wonderful conveniences we have didn't have a quilt shop to go to and see all the new lines from Tula Pink, you know? Uh, so I love that uh, part of it. And it's just a passion of mine. So, and I also collect antique fabrics too. So I, I just love it. I, I can't even, I don't even know what sparked that. I don't have anybody. My great grandmother was a quilter on my mom's side, but my grandmother and my mother were not. On my dad's side, my grandmother was a quilter, but she was a utilitarian quilter where it was just squares hand piece together. So it wasn't like show pieces necessarily, or not, not even show pieces, but she wouldn't try different patterns. It was always just squares together. So right. I, my mother hated sewing, still hates sewing. Uh, it stresses her out. Um, so I don't know where it came from. Well, and I, it was from a very young age. So it's not even, you know, it was, I was in my twenties when I really started quilting. I think it was 24 when I started quilting and then uh, really started collecting after that. Well, I know if, uh, the comments on here, uh, many people are familiar with your YouTube channel and they love it. And they're, yeah. they've loved your presentation very much as well. They're saying absolutely fabulous, very impressive, wonderful presentation. So I'm blushing. <laughs> everybody, everybody has loved it. Now, just before we uh, finish up on this, are there any other questions uh, for Chris? And if um, so, just. Uh, yeah. Oh, I wanted to show. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have a question. I well, I I kind of have a comment. Is someone else going? I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask, what's your opinion about putting labels on my my mom's or my great aunt's quilt, and because they're not labeled now, but and I suppose I'm only the carrier of the information about these. How would you suggest I do that if you think that's appropriate for me to do? I absolutely think it's appropriate. I, I think you do need to go back and label that. Um, I would just hand applique down. That way it's not a permanent thing. You're not writing directly onto the quilt and just hand applique a nice label on there and explain it, you know, or, you know, at least at the very least keep like um, some records on it that somebody can know to go to. I don't know if you keep a quilt journal or anything like that, but have some sort of record that somebody could refer to it. I wouldn't know particularly a year specific, but I mean, I could say that it was made during the, for a wedding gift and they were married in 41 or something like that. Is that still? That's perfect. So whatever information you can give or even say, I don't know for sure. It, it probably, you know, you could even say it was made probably between this date and this date, but I'm not sure. You know, I think that's just anything, any information you can give um, future generations about it, even if it's not super specific, is better than no information, you know, where do, most of these quilts. Do I say the same information, like from me personally, is this is 
uh, a great niece or something like that? Do I say that or do I put my name on it as well as who I think made it? I think so. That's that's how I would do it. Uh, but I think you could do it. Any 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 information is going to be good. But I would do it from my point of view. Um, the way I make labels is I put them through my printer, so I type it up, and I'll put I'll put several paragraphs on information. Okay. And uh, yeah, I would say that I'm the owner of it now. I'm writing this because I have this quilt in my possession, but it wasn't labeled. Mm-hmm. I needed to get it labeled. That's how I would do it. Uh, you know, I think that it's really what you're comfortable with, but it's important for me. It's important for other generations to know. I wish, I wish half these quilts had labels. I wish I knew. Cause I, I speculate and I get into my own head and I have these imaginary scenarios on what was going on when they were made. And uh, I would love to know if I'm right. You yeah. know, so. Well, thank you very much. And I do enjoy your show as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. So Tracy has a, a comment or a question here. She says, I have heard you're not supposed to store them in plastic bags. True. And if so, why? Uh, so, yeah, so you, you want, I mean, it's cotton fabric usually. Uh, so breathing, it, you know, if you put them into plastic for a long period of time, they can get mildewy. They can also um, get moisture, you know, develop moisture possibly, or just the smell and the, like, you know, you think of any type of clothes, like if you pack up your summer or winter clothes how they kind of have that musty smell so if they're in a long time uh, as far as trash bags i think i think it's a bad idea just because i think they could be taken out and, and for the simple ra- fact of possibly being tossed out by accident because they're in bags um so i get nervous about that uh, i can't say that i don't have some of my quilts and totes and plastic totes because i do because i i have so many right now uh, but i try my best to rotate them out too so they are breathing but it's, it's mostly just getting the air circulation around them. And Nancy asks, do you think your labels made in the printer won't fade? Ah, it's a million dollar question. I've had that question on my, because I have a label video too. And I've had that question. So it depends on the ink on your printer. So my the ink that for my printer is a pigment ink. They may fade, you know, they may fade. I may have to go back and relabel them. I'm okay with that, with my own quilts. I also keep a quilt journal. Um, so it, I think it depends on how many times you wash them, that type of thing. Um, for like any table runner or something that I'm not washing very often, I'm not even worried about it. Other ones that I have, um, I printed my son's quilt. I made both my boys, I have two, two grown sons. And I, when they turned 13, I made them each a t-shirt quilt. And on the backs, I printed their label and have it sewn right in and they have both they've been washed and washed and washed and they haven't faded so i think it depends on your printer it depends on the ink in your printer and then just keep an eye on it or try it out and wash it a few times and see what happens but um for me that's the easiest way that's the way i'm going to do it if i'm going to embroider or anything like i'm not going to get it done so for me it's just printing it's just easy and it gets done and sherry says chris do you have a favorite one (laughs) they're like my kids do i have a just the last one i bought is always my favorite (laughs) um i have a favorite i'm looking around like do i have a favorite i love them all for very different reasons now i can't say i have a favorite but i can tell you i have ones i don't like so Ah. there are there are definitely ones in my collection um Recently, I think it was two or three videos ago, I had a quilt. Uh, I I can't even explain it because I get feelings from these quilts. Like, I know this sounds crazy. You guys are all going to think I'm crazy, but I get like um, vibes sometimes. And um, this particular quilt had a really negative vibe with it and a negative feeling came through this quilt. And I couldn't even keep it in my house anymore after I did the video. So there are, there are definitely quilts I do not like. And uh Nance or Rebecca says, um, no, wait, was it? No, it was Laura. Laura says, uh, she has used printed labels on with her inkjet printer in the eighties. And those labels are faded. She says now, are they, oh man, um, course, you, if that was in the eighties, the ink technology has changed quite a bit now. So it's hard to say. It is hard to say, but again, just relabel it, just rewrite the information, you know, and get a new label on it. Yeah. And Nancy wants to know if you've ever used spoon flower labels and do they last? 
Uh, so I haven't, uh, but I, it's so funny you talk, I mean, it's so funny when these questions come up and it's something, a conversation I had uh, just this morning with somebody else um, that uh, a friend of mine, she was saying how she just ordered spoon flower labels with her logo and all that stuff on it. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to try them, but I haven't tried them yet. Yeah, I've I haven't done. had, I haven't purchased any spoon flower fa fabric as much as I love it. And I always am tempted to, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, I, I just ordered some labels too, and I haven't used a lot of them yet, but uh, to try it as well. But I have no idea how long they'll last because I just got them. Time will tell. Time I, will uh, tell. I think that's a good question with that. You know, um, uh, I would, uh, for me, it's whatever's easy. Finished. If I if I have to oh, no. do a ton with the labels, I'm not going to make the label. Yep, that's true. That's true. So uh, just before we finish up, is there any last minute questions for Chris? Um, Review on the cre creepy quilt. I tried to find it on your channel. What is the YouTube video named? <laughs> oh, see, you're gonna, you, you guys are gonna be like, okay. So first of all, the picture, the picture of the quilt, like on video, it looked a lot better than it was. But I will tell you. Let me go to my con or my content, and I'll tell you the exact name of that one. This was lessons from a scrappy nine patch quilt. It was it was published a month ago. It's seven minutes long, so if you can look at it through that, um, let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, I don't know. It looks if you can see. Can you see? Yeah. The top of it. Yeah, you can get an idea. My pictures in the corner. Um, yeah, that was the creepy quote, and I didn't talk about how creepy it was too much in the video uh, because I kept thinking I'm crazy. I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, uh, this. I. It's a quote, but uh, my dog wouldn't go anywhere near it. Um, I couldn't shake this feeling. I got very emotional about it afterward and I had to get it out of my house, unfortunately. It's the only quilt I've ever done that with, um, but. Yeah, I was very interested in that. This is Kathy. I was Hi, interested in that quilt when you were talking about it with Sobeka and I yes. searched and searched and yeah, I just love that. And yeah, some, some quilts could probably do that too. So I, I feel you, you know, I want, I just want to investigate it with the video more. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, I talked about that. I was in an interview with Sobeka and I do talk about it, how it brought me to tears. Um, just, there were just bad emotions in this quote and I'm usually not like that. Um, but boy, that quote really knocked me for a loop and I, I had to throw it, I threw it away. I I've never done that. And I threw it away, uh, because, and I had people in my comments that had said, Hey, if you don't like it, cause I talked about, it, I didn't like the quilt itself it was weird construction and they're like, send it to me, send it to me. And I, I can tell you, I didn't want to put it into anybody else's hands. I didn't want to donate it. I did not want that bad energy or whatever it is uh, to be out there in the world. So I'm going to bring the, uh, the presentation to an end. This has been absolutely wonderful. And I can see another presentation here about creepy quilts and haunted <laughs> quilts coming up too. Now, if you have, I, I don't know uh, how long Chris is going to be hanging around, uh, more than welcome to hang around for as long as you like. If you do have other questions for her, you might want to ask those in the um, comment or in the chat section of this. We do have another presentation coming up in half an hour and we have some more draws coming up as well. But Chris, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating.